passed on. Ladies and gentlemen, can we begin, please? Thank you very much. A very warm welcome to all of you to tonight's panel discussion on academic and cultural links with Israel. I'm Paula Ensor, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, and I'm also Chair of the Board of the Gordon Institute for the Performing and Creative Arts. I will be chairing tonight's panel with the assistance of Jay Paffa, the Director of the Gordon Institute, and Imran Kuvadia, the Director of the Centre for Creative Writing and the organiser of the Great Text series. Before we begin this evening's proceedings, I wish to draw your attention to refreshments will be, which will be at the back of the hall, and particularly to our Muslim guests who may wish to break the fast during the proceedings. They should feel free to do so. We will have a stand with dates and water and halal crackers at the back of the hall, and you should feel completely welcome and free uh, to, to um, partake of that uh, when you so choose. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our four panelists. William Kentridge is known to all of us. His work has been seen in museums and galleries around the world since the 1990s, including the Documenta in Kassel, Germany, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Albertina Museum in Vienna, and the Jeux de Pomme in Paris, Paris. His production of Mozart's The Magic Flute was presented at Theatre de la Monnaie in, in Brussels, and in 2011 at La Scala in Milan. He directed Shostakovich's The Nose for the Met Opera in, in New York in 2010 to coincide with a major exhibition at MoMA. Also in 2010, at the Louvre in Paris, he presented Carnet d'Egypte, a project conceived especially for the Egyptian room at the Louvre. In the same year, Kentridge received the prestigious Kyoto Prize in recognition for his contributions in the field of arts and philosophy. Next to him is Andrew Nash, an associate professor in the Department of Political Studies, where he teaches the history of political thought. Before that, he taught philosophy and politics at the universities of Stellenbosch and the Western Cape and was editorial director of Monthly Review Press in New York. He is the author of The Dialectical Tradition in South Africa and is currently chair of the UCT Palestine Solidarity Forum. Dennis Davis uh, is a judge of the High Court in Cape Town. He has been judge president of the Competition Appeal Court since 2000. He was a professor of law at UCT where he currently still teaches at, as an honorary professor and at the University of the Vatisrand, where he was the director of the Center for Applied Legal Studies between 1990 and 97. While at Cowles, he acted as legal advisor to the multi-party conference that drafted the South African Constitution. He's the author of 10 books, a great many articles on legal theory, constitutional law, taxation, and so forth, uh, and he's held visiting professor professorships at Toronto, Melbourne, Harvard, NYU, Florida, Brown, and Georgetown. And finally, uh, Zaki Ahmad, who is a political activist and most widely known as founder and chairperson of the Treatment Action Campaign, and for his work on behalf of people, including himself, living with HIV and AIDS in South Africa. In 2008, Tech helped coordinate the efforts of civil society to assist people displaced by xenophobic violence. From these efforts, Zaki joined others to found the Social Justice Coalition, an organization to dedicate, dedicated to promoting safety and security for all people in South Africa. Currently, he serves as a member of the SJC Secretariat and also on the Board of Equal Education. Zaki is a member of Open Shahuda Street, Shahuda Street and works directly with Palestinians and Israelis resisting the occupation through grassroots and nonviolent methods. As you will have seen from the announcement for tonight's panel, the question posed for discussion is as follows. South African artists and cultural boycotts, should the latest call for a cultural boycott of Israel be heeded? The question was selected because the issue of whether to perform or exhibit in Israel has been very much in the public eye over the past period. The visit of Dada Masilo, the debate about the Cape Town opera visit, 
and the performance of, um, of Porgy and Bess, and links between the University of Johannesburg and Ben Gurion. The question of links and boycotts is raised specifically about Israel here tonight, but the question is a much broader one, which we are very likely to face in relationship to China and other countries where we feel that there are abuses of civil rights. There is a wider question to be addressed here. Is it an appropriate strategy in our present context to give effect to moral or political position via cultural and academic boycotts? Earlier this year, under the banner of the Great Text series, a panel similar to the present was constituted to debate the topic Israel, Palestine, and South Africa. In the organization of the event and in its adver advertisement, no reference was made to the creative and performing arts or to the focus of great texts. It was my view as chair of the Gordon Institute board that this event was inappropriate located as a great text event and I postponed it so that it could be recast to align with the broad remit of the great text series. This recasting has happened and tonight's panel is the result. I know that there are those who objected to the postponing and there were those who objected to having it at all. I have no doubt that widely divergent views will emerge in the course of this discussion and all of these will be strongly held. I have no doubt that all of us at times during the discussion will be tempted to call out a correction, register disagreement or hurl the odd word of praise, agreement and insult. I ask you to resist that temptation forcefully and however vehemently you disagree with a point of view, hold on to it until it is your turn to speak. Freedom of speech and academic freedom is respected here and it will be vigorously defended. So let us turn to the organization of tonight's event. The plan is to proceed as follows. The panelists will speak for up to 10 minutes, starting with William Kentridge, followed by Andrew Nash, Dennis Davis, and Zaki Ahmad. We will then take 20 minutes for the panelists to engage with each other before opening the debate to the floor. The interaction on the floor will proceed for about 50 minutes, and then we will allow the panelists to round up at the end for about two minutes each in reverse order. So I'd like to initiate this evening's proceedings by asking William to kick off. Thank you, William. Thank you. I am led to believe we have exactly 10 minutes each to speak. So before I begin, before the clock gets switched on. Of necessity, there are ten, 10 elements that I wanted to talk about in the discussion, but I will have to scrap several of them. What I was going to talk about is how I decided to stay in the studio, the first section. Second section is about exhibitionism, what it is to have exhibitions. The third, where I will be talking about, is where art comes from. The fourth is about the politics of pragmatism. The fifth is about compromised institutions and their uses. The seventh is about internal and external questions. The eighth is about how we brought down apartheid. And the ninth is about the dog in the night, things that are not said. So just if a lot are left out, those are kind of root maps of things that we may return to later if there is time. But to start in 1965, when 496 academics from 34 United Kingdom institutions signed a letter calling for an academic boycott of South African universities, saying that no job should be applied for and no job should be accepted. And in many ways, this is the start of what became the academic and the cultural boycott of South Africa. Now, it seems to me implicit in that call was the assumption that circumstances were so bad in South Africa, the oppression, the racial oppression, the racial exploitation was so bad, institutions were so compromised of necessity existing within the apartheid structure that the most that could be done would be to resist all of them, to make matters worse so that they could get better, to exacerbate the contradictions. And this, in a broad way, is the shape of the 
boycott call that continued in South Africa and for me seems to be the shape of the boycott called um, in Israel. And what it did very early on was to separate, to say we outside South Africa are hygienic, we are clean. We don't have the filth of you who stay in South Africa. Specifically directed towards whites, but directed towards all who in one way or another benefited from the system of racial exploitation that characterized South Africa. And one of the things that happened over the time was that this ongoing debate and question arose between were the circumstances in South Africa, which were indefensible, the political circumstances, the violence meted out by the South African repressive apparatus towards black people in South Africa, were these such that the best that could be do would be to try to cut off all contact with people in the country? And very soon, contradictions started emerging. And it's really about a place for these contradictions that I will be arguing arguing for a place of them not as a compromise but as very fundamental to the way that politics worked and works and is the only way of understanding what can or could happen in the Middle East as well. Take for example the, cult, the, the, the academic boycott which grew stronger and stronger in the 1980s when it was on the one hand most supported by left-wing or liberal universities in Britain and other places while at the same time there was more and more contact and intellectual debate between them. There was a period in which the University of Sussex, the University of SOAS, were as it were satellite institutions of South African universities. The number of graduate students that would shift and cross. And in fact, at the same time, you had, and I think correctly, the dual situation of an academic boycott being called for and at the same time, and by the same people, it being substantially and substantively ignored. And this dual position, this unclear, messy position, seems to me the only way to understand what our history has been and should be the lens through which we look at calls for the purity, the cleanliness of cultural boycotts, the either-or of cultural boycotts. To think about other compromised institutions, there were many people during the apartheid years, particularly outside, who said in a way that could not be denied that so many South African institutions were completely compromised. How could one practice law in South Africa when the laws you were practicing were the laws of apartheid? How could you not be saying it is not me on trial if you were a prisoner, but you, the court, that is on trial, which it should have been? Many of these things were there, but at the same time, at the same time, there were many people subject to those laws who still chose to use them, understanding that within those compromised institutions, within those institutions that, as every university did, on the one hand, had extraordinary departments of philosophy, of politics, were completely involved in different forms of trade union struggle and development, and at the same time were also producing engineers to further the smooth, efficient operation of gold mines throughout the country. Institutions did, particularly in circumstances like South Africa, do both these things. And certainly as a white person who chose to stay in South Africa rather than leave, the acknowledgement was that one lived in a situation of not just compromise, but of being compromised, of benefiting, whether one liked it or not, from the system of exploitation and racial laws that existed in South Africa. And the question has to be now, 20 years after apartheid, 20 years after the start of the dismantling of apartheid, whether those people who stayed, whether those compromised institutions, in fact, have a part to play, have a part to play now. And one of the ways of doing that is to look at what happened during elements of the cultural boycott. There was a way in which art and art making got reduced to its most pragmatic form. It became a political tactic. There was a sense of was this art making going to be useful for the, for the revolution or would it not? And as the selective boycott and the cultural desk grew, what you had was a series of politicians and very often those politicians were artists. And sometimes I also, to my shame, participated in this process of deciding what could or could not be seen, what should or should not be heard, what work curators could or could not take in and out of the country. 
And the immediate result of this was that the strange meeting point of the unconscious, of the unruly, undisciplined, unaligned subconscious and unconsciousness, and how that meets the outside world and actually makes art, got constrained till the work that was seen and made was able to fit through the narrow turnstiles of the cultural gatekeepers. And the effects of this for many people were calamitous. One thinks of a great artist like Dumile, whose demonic energy produced some of the most remarkable drawings and artworks to come out of South Africa. And when he left and came under the sway of art having to be of tactical use to a political movement, it disappeared. It became polite. It became an art of fists and slogans without the conviction behind them. And when he was no longer needed, when the tactical aim had been reached, when the apartheid system came down and he was no longer needed to be paraded at rallies and conferences as the artistic voice of apartheid, he was abandoned and died. There are many other institutions which came under attack correctly. They came under attack correctly as they were manifestations of a South Africa that was untenable, unacceptable and immoral. But 20 years later, what one hangs on to and hopes for were those people who understanding or not understanding that situation, even those who are not understanding, but who still felt, felt a commitment to those institutions are those that run them and on which we hope to build a future. One of the things that happened when art was seen simply as a tactical, uh, a tactical weapon in the in the armory of resistance to South Africa, and there's a second thing which we should come back to, which was what in fact its specific use was, what in fact changed South Africa. A lot of the writing about the cultural boycott in Israel talks as if the cultural and academic boycott is in fact what brought down the nationalist government, and there's a perspective one needs to take on that. But one of the things that happened was that a lot of institutions to take the broadest one, not related to the cultural and academic boycott at all, which were destroyed by the tactics through which they were used, have not been, have not been rebuilt in the years since then. And although it seems ridiculous that many of, both many of the institutions that were so compromised and many of the, also the people that worked within them, that contradictory act, activity of both supporting a boycott and ignoring it I think is the one that feels to me the most accurate and the most correct and the most responsive to how we have in fact uh, operated in South Africa. I see my time is up. There are many other things we will come back to, I hope. Thank you. Th thank you. Let me start by explaining what I take to be the most basic mistake that is made in discussing the uh, conflict between Israel and Palestine, the oppression of the Palestinian people, whatever shorthand we're going to use, because given time constraints, we've got to use some or other shorthand, which is going to take in the occupation of the West Bank, the siege of Gaza, the dispossession of the uh, mass of uh, Palestinians in the area that's now Israel, and the... Uh, systematic discrimination against uh, Arab Israelis, the, uh, a quarter of the, um, the population of, uh, of the State of Israel. The most basic mistake, it seems to me, is to see it in isolation, as if in history you can take one, each case one at a time, start with, uh, and I think it might be a mistake also, in talking about South Africa or China and human rights abuses there. It's not something which is confined to that particular territory. It's not a local conflict confined even to the Middle East region or to Muslims or, and Jews. It is essentially what it concerns, it seems to me, it concerns all those things also, but it concerns social justice on a global scale, and that's how I want to approach it. That's how also the UCT Palestine Solidarity Forum, with which I'm associated, defines its task not a concern with anything else except achieving social justice or trying to educate and so on in support of social justice for everyone in that region.
based on equal rights regardless of uh, religion, race, and uh, ethnicity. In a certain sense, it's obvious that the issue is global. What happens in Israel and Palestine doesn't stay there. It spills over, so it impacts as far afield as the bar mitzvah of Judge Richard Goldstone's grandson in Johannesburg. It feeds into the, uh, the rising tide of Islamophobia, which results now, some of you may know about how in a number of, United, of uh, American states there's currently draft legislation being discussed which is going to outlaw Sharia and observance of, uh, of Sharia, painting the mosque, uh, banking with uh, funds that don't um, invest in pork and alcohol or, or, or whatever. In all kinds of ways, it has those effects. But that's not what I want to talk about in the first place. What I want to talk about is the way in which the oppression of Palestinians depends on principles which cannot remain simply within that context, which need, in order to be sustained, to be spread globally. And that is, uh, as I say, what, uh, what happens. Um, the, in, in this context, we, we'll find that if we do not stand up against that oppression, if we do not act in solidarity, those principles will catch up with us wherever we are, including in academic and, uh, and cultural life. That's the argument that I, uh, I, I want to make in the brief time at my disposal. Uh, it is, in that sense, it seems to me, one of the defining issues of our time. It's not just something that concerns one or two societies or a particular region. It concerns what kind of ways are going to be possible, what social possibilities are going to be available for humankind. And that region serves as a kind of laboratory, or has been serving as a kind of laboratory for techniques of domination and perhaps also resistance, which have the potential to change the direction of human history for better or, uh, or, 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 or worse. During the 20th century, a process has, be, uh, has been underway of undoing a long and rich and complex history of um, multicultural existence, of universalism of outlook, of diversity of opinion, of cultural tolerance that you could date back, I suppose, to the Arab conquest of, uh, well, much of that region, but when the, uh, o the Caliph Omar took possession of Jerusalem, his first act was to welcome Jews back into the city that they'd been banned from for centuries. And Jews and Muslims lived together, I'm sure with many frictions, but lived together in that one city and many other cities in the eastern uh, Mediterranean region for a, a thousand years and change after that until it came to be undone. And if that undoing is to be completed, is to be made irre irrevocable, to be made the pattern of the future, then it is going to have impact and consequences wherever political life um, uh, exists. Uh, okay, so what I'm saying is then we need to look at what makes it distinctive. The first most obvious feature of what makes the oppression of Palestinian people distinctive is it's the only case that we can think of in which international laws, norms, resolutions of global bodies and so on are consistently over many decades flouted. That happens often enough, but the only case in which this happens with the agreement and the enthusiastic support of the world's major powers and the acquiescence of almost all governments around the world. Sometimes, as in the South African government's case, they will dissent, uh, if you like, in rhetoric, but will basically accept that this is the case, that it's not something that they can stand up with. There are worse atrocities elsewhere, but in this case, it seems to me to fall into a category of, uh, of, of its own. There are many ways in which that oppression is sustained which are not new, which draw on things that have happened in the past. The notion of ethnic separation or religious separation being necessary goes back, I suppose, to the Crusades, to the expulsion of Jews from Spain and England and other countries in the 15th century and, um, and, and, and after, um, to the whole refusal of the West to take a, a, a responsibility, to be accountable for its impact on the, um, the uh, uh, world which it conquered, expressed now in its willingness to atone, to make good its own history of persecution of Jews over many centuries, 
to make good, to make good on that at the expense of the Palestinian people. Even the notion of seeing a certain population as somehow surplus to humanity, not needing to be participating in the ordinary life of humanity in the way their resources allow, is given, I mean, has a longer history, including clearly the history of the, um, the Nazi Holocaust, uh, and is given a new form in the siege of, uh, of Gaza. All of those, as I say, are old. What is new to it? What is new about that form of oppression is that it takes place under the auspices of a framework of, uh, I suppose, democracy, due process, legalism, and so on. It's given that hollowed out form and validated in, um, in that, uh, that, that, that way. It's a, a version of the world is presented which is, becomes increasingly divorced from the reality. One can go through, and I mean, with time uh, limited, I'm not going to try and do it, what the violations are of uh, uh, resolutions adopted by the United Nations, Geneva Convention, International Court of Justice, even in relation to the uh, apartheid wall being built on the West Bank, violations of decisions of the uh, Israeli Supreme Court. I could speak also of the daily humiliations and injustices inflicted on Palestinian people in relation to the uprooting of orchards, the uh, stripping away of land, the, check, the checkpoints, the barriers and so on, the separate roads, the ways in which people are dependent. I could go through all that, but, you know, I, well, I have two minutes left, so let me uh, move ahead of that. What I want to say, what's essential to it, what I want to emphasize is for all of those, there is a legal pretext that has the backing of a democracy in Israel constantly mobilizing the fears of its uh, citizens. Whoever points out the intention behind the, uh, the humiliations and so on, that person can be accused of, um, of anti-Semitism, of malice or whatever else. If there's an outcry, more abuse can be heaped upon them. Let me give two examples quickly, and it's, uh, I'll, I'll probably have to... Um, from there, move quickly to the question of the, uh, of the boycott, both taken from uh, security checkpoints in the year 2004. The first concerns uh, it's a routine procedure at Ben Gurion uh, um, your pardon, Ben Gurion Airport near Tel Aviv, that um, uh, Ar Arabs, whether Muslim or Christian, get searched, very often strip searched, including uh, young women and so on, and, and old people. And the, um, when this happens, the one case that comes to my mind is when a 79-year-old Holocaust survivor and uh, peace activist, Hedy Epstein, was held for five hours at the airport, strip-searched, strip and, new term to me, cavity-searched. The, um, you know, the intention was clear to everyone, in her words, to, uh, to humiliate and terrify me, but... There was no public outcry. There was no way of going past that pretext. Let me go to one other case. In November 2004, a Palestinian man was filmed uh, playing his violin at an Israeli checkpoint near Nablus on the, uh, on, on, on the West Bank, um, while soldiers mocked and laughed at him and so on. The outcry that followed was because the image reminded people so strongly of the Jews in that time having been mocked and so on, in that particular case, the blame could quickly be put on him. Right. The opportunity to carry on. Uh, firstly, right, thank you, uh, Dennis. Uh, Over to you. Thank you. Uh, firstly, let me thank you, Paula, for organising this. I think this is a terribly important issue. I just want to express one view in relation as having been involved in these debates for some years. I really do hope that these difficult questions which we're dealing with are not ones where we simply walk into the room with a view, we walk out with the same view that we walked into, because quite frankly, there's no then purpose having about let's go and have a drink and, and, and we can cut out an hour and a half of wasted time. These are important issues. And I want to immediately say that I associate myself with, with William. I'm very proud to be on the same sort of side as he, one of my great heroes of modern South Africa. But it's important for me then to say to you what this debate is not about, for me. The debate is not about the occupation. It is not about trying to justify the occupation, which is an egregious abomination, the longest occupation 
for some 40 years. It's unjustified. It should have stopped today, not tomorrow or not the next day. If you're against an academic boycott, does not mean you're in favor of the occupation. This is not for me a debate about the fact that we have an egregiously right-wing Israeli government, which is probably the most right-wing government that Israel's had for a very long time. This is not a debate for me which seeks in any way to defend right-wing Jewish communities around the world who do call people anti-Semites at the drop of a hat, who want to shut down debate, and for whom Israel can do no wrong and Palestinians can do no right. It's not about those issues at all. It's not about trying to deny the pain, the suffering, the anguish on a daily basis which Palestinians have suffered as a result of the occupation. What this debate about is about one profound thing and one profound thing only, for me at least. It's about what is the best form of progressive politics to contribute to the kind of peace that is absolutely essential in that area. What in our little modest way can we do, and let's not kid ourselves, we have a small, if any, contribution to make, and what should that be? Now, for me, let me must make two or three points in relation to this. For me, I refuse to give up on the idea that it is possible for Israel, absent an occupation, to conform to the values which I was taught as a young boy and which I continue to hold. The values which are best encapsulated for me in the Torah dictum, Tzedek, Tzedek, Tirdof, Justice, Justice, Thou Shalt Pursue. And my rabbi, Rabbi Vashinsky, told me something very important about that, why the Bible actually uses the word justice twice. Because it uses justice for us and it uses justice for the other. And you cannot have justice unless you have it for yourself and for the other. And so for me, I refuse to give up on a politics that does not seek to deal with that in the Middle East. This whole debate is about the power of ideas. It is about the power of art. It's about the possibility of comradeship, collaboration between like-minded people, Palestinians and Israelis. It's about the idea that there are ideas out there that we can use together. It's about a refusal to be cowed by right-wing people who want to shut us up. Let me be quite blunt, if we have an academic boycott, you know who's going to celebrate more than anybody else? Mr. Netanyahu and his colleagues. Because they want to really, if you know anything about Israel, to have a whole range of legislation which is going to shut people up. And I refuse to believe that we should give in to that, whether we're Jewish, Palestinian, or anything else. It's about trying, it seems to me, to build some prefigured notion of a community that transcends difference. And that's why I think the academic boycott is so patent absurd. Sari Nuzubai, the president of Al-Quds University, admittedly says he's a minority voice in this, but says the academic community within Israel is the most progressive element within Israeli society. Why would you want to cut them off? Why can't we, in fact, work within that dialectical relationship where on the one hand we critique, but in the other way we engage? And if you think the academic boycott had success in South Africa, think again. It really rendered our universities as academically dry deserts. We still pay the price for that academic boycott today in South Africa. Just look at our universities. They're hardly pulsating centers of, of intellectual debate on a day. This is quite unique to have a debate like this. And I say, no, we should, in a sense, be doing something different. To the extent of a boycott, for me, it's a politics of despair. Even as I do understand the argument that it may be one of the few nonviolent ways in which people can, in fact, articulate their opposition. But if that's the only form of politics, then it is the politics of despair. Because it wasn't the boycott that brought down Mubarak. It was, the, it was nonviolent politics within Egypt. And if you're a progressive, it's that kind of politics that you'd be thinking about, and it's that that you'd be worrying about in relation to the questions of a boycott. Let me make one or two final points in relation to this. Andrew Nash talks about global justice. He's right to do that. But I can't help feeling the peculiarity 
that with all its warts and all its problems and with all its dangers, Israel at least is a place where you can have this kind of debate, where we can engage to some extent with all its warts. And why are we having then, if we're so interested in global justice, a meeting of this kind of magnitude today when hundreds of people on a day-by-day -day basis are being killed in Syria? I mean, is there, a, is there a sense in which, in fact, I can't help feeling, to be quite blunt, that there's a moral equivalence to this and it comes up all the time. You want a global politics, let's build it and it should compose, obviously, of Palestine and Israel within the broader context. But I would want to say this about the issue, that within Israel itself, there is such a complexity of voice that it is ridiculous to try to reduce it to the kind of analysis that I've just heard. Let me just give you one illustration. And if somebody just bothered to read the Aretz every day, they'd just realize precisely what I'm talking about. But here's an article by Yitzchak Leor, an Israeli poet and author, very recently. And he talks about the failure of Zionism. And he says this, the land of Israel is a fantasy. Withdrawing from parts of it is presented as a concession even by supporters of the move. But the only concession we needed to make, even back in 1967, was giving up the messianic claim that this is our land from the Bible, and therefore we have a right to it. In comparison with this claim, the Serbs, with their preoccupation of the Battle of Kosovo in 1389, are rational, secular people. He goes on, had masses of Israelis had the sense to say, on the morning after the occupation in 67, instead of choosing that of all moments, with the help of professors and poets and writers, to discover undivided country, we would be in a different situation today. Liberation from Zionism is not a dirty word. In any case, what lies behind Zionism nowadays are interests related to water, real estate, strategic relations with the US, and a huge army hungering to justify its existence. That's an Israeli talking, in Israeli domain. And you want to have a boycott and you just want to send him off and have nothing more to do with him when he takes daily risks. You don't want to build a kind of coalition of people who have like ideas to ultimately create the kind of future where Palestinians and Israelis can, in fact, enjoy justice. It's a complex situation. And I would be failing in my duty not to point out to you that Israel does face an existential threat. And it makes it different to South Africa and apartheid. We didn't have people threatening to drop atomic bombs on us. And we didn't face a threat which quite understandably is inextricably linked into the Jewish psyche because of thousands of years of oppression and the Holocaust in particular. And it seems to me the politics of engagement, the politics of actually being able to understand of how we can move outside of an existential threat to some kind of true engagement, Palestinians and Israelis, is essential to this. You want a global politics of justice in summary, let's have one. But it seems to me that what this debate about is typically looking at one particular scenario may not even be the worst, and building a case which ignores both the complexity of the situation, the inherent divisions within Israel, and the ability to actually not isolate those who have like-minded views about justice for us and justice for others. If we can only do that, we can move beyond the silly idea of, of boycotts and move to the kind of engagement which will reinforce those who believe that we, like we should do, that there should be justice for both Palestinians and Israelis. Thank you, Dennis. Over to you, Zaki. Good evening. Andrew, do you support the boycott, the cultural and academic boycott? Okay, so it's very clear that I'm going to associate myself with a different moral vision and something that I regard as the only moral vision, and that is an academic and cultural economic boycott of Israel. I want to respond very, very quickly to Dennis Davis's rather selective view of what's happening in Syria and in the Middle East. The Syrians have called for a boycott. The Syrians have called for sanctions against their regime. And I support those sanctions. 
and any thinking person will support those sanctions. Dennis, you didn't mention a single Palestinian voice. The Palestinian voice is one that has called for the boycott, sanctions, and divestment. And it's not only Palestinians, it's Israelis too. Neve Gordon, among others. So let me start. I was going to speak about two great texts and possibly a third. And the two great texts I want to bring to your attention is first and foremost, the letter by Hannah Arendt and, 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 and Albert Einstein to the New York Times, in which they call for a boycott of Menachem Begin, Dennis. The second letter, or the second article, and great text I want to bring to you, is that of Zev Jabotinsky. His Iron War published here in the Jewish Herald in 1937. And the third text I want to bring to you is an interview with a Palestinian, Narima Tamimi, in the Electronic Intifada. And I know there are going to be people here who think that the Electronic Intifada is a bunch of terrorists, but so be it. Everyone knows, as Amos Ilan has said, that we have a moral obligation to address the question of Palestine because the road to Israel's independence was paved on the backs of these people, Palestinian people, they paid with their bodies, their property, and their future for the pogroms in the Ukraine and the Nazi gas chambers. So the first question, when Dennis speaks to us of the Holocaust, the first question we have to say is who paid the price for it? When Hannah Arendt, when Hannah Arendt speaks of Menachem Begin, she speaks also today of the majority of Israel's Knesset. She speaks of the fascism of Likud. She speaks of people who are prepared to destroy the bodies, the minds, the properties of Palestinian people. I see there's a lot of academic freedom by, suggested by some people. She, she called specifically, let me read to you what she said about Herut. She said, it was formed out of the membership and following of Irgun, a terrorist right-wing chauvinist organization in Palestine. And if there's anyone who wishes to challenge that, well, then you're going against all the facts in history. The second question is Zev Jabotinsky. Zev Jabotinsky was at least honest in his approach to the question of Palestinians and of Arabs. And he made it very clear. He said the native population, civilized or uncivilized, have always stubbornly resisted the colonists irrespective of whether they were civilized or savage. And it made no difference whatever, whether the colonists behaved decently or not. Now, should we have an academic boycott, yes or no? Dennis poses the question as one of wanting to isolate progressive academics. William Kentridge speaks in an absolutism on which demonstrate the conceit of the artist and of, uh, and of art. Let me point to you the first and most important question. Art depends on education. The inheritance that we all have as a global society of education. Is there anyone here who can argue that education in Israel is not an apartheid education? That Jewish children are not allowed to share their schools with their Palestinian counterparts. Is there anyone here who can argue that the amount of money spent on a Palestinian child is much less than an amount spent on a Jewish child? Is there anyone here who will argue 
that over 90% of master's degrees at Israeli universities are in fact only Jewish people and despite the fact that 25% of the population are Arab or Palestinian. Is there anyone here who is going to say that 40,000 children in occupied East Jerusalem do not have classrooms where they can go to. They have to be taught in garages, in flats, in, in any amount of building that is unsafe. And that the Israeli Supreme Court has recognized it twice, most recently on February the 6th this year. But the Israeli government has ignored every single ruling to make education equal. So the question I have for William and I have for Dennis is simple. Can we have a genuine art and a progressive art when in fact the majority of people are denied education? And by majority of people here, I include the Israelis because the, the Israeli children suffer as much from not seeing Palestinians as human beings. Let me speak, uh, how much time do I have? Three minutes. Let me speak to you of the repression of minors. But before I start, I want to tell you about Nariman Tamimi. Nariman's husband Basim Tamimi is in jail. Nariman herself was arrested many times. Her 14-year-old son was shot in the leg. He's wanted by the Israeli police. And she's hiding him, and I support her hiding him, and so should every decent person. Thank you, Benny. Now let me point this to you. Let me point out this to you. Israel, over the last few years, according to Beth Selem, has arrested more than 865 children, have kept them in jail. 93% of them were not denied bail. Most of them are arrested in the middle of the night. And let me speak to you about the apartheid law. There is not one law for Palestinians and one law for Israelis. When Barbara Hogan and Ahmed Katrada were charged here in South Africa, they were both regarded terrorists, Dennis, am I right? But what happens to an Israeli child and a Palestinian child if they're both arrested? An Israeli is regarded as a child until the, the age of 18. A Palestinian, 16. An Israeli child or adult will go and be arrested and sp spend their time in a civilian jail, whether they're in the occupied territories or not, whether they're settlers or not, illegal settlers. All of them are illegal. The simple question that I have for you is to, to ask yourself, what happens to the Palestinian child which charged under military law? What sort of education are we giving them? And someone's going to sh say to me, yes, but they throw stones and, and, and all that. Yes, I threw stones too, so don't give me that answer. Kids taken at gunpoint in the middle of the night. Now, one can go on and on and on and on. But the simple question I want to say to you that Nariman Tamimi said is that she saw every Israeli person as someone with a gun. But because of Jewish dissenters, like Yonatan Pollack, who puts his body on the line daily in Israel and in Palestine, because of Jewish dissenters like that, she sees him as a human being. I support the academic and cultural boycott because I believe we should not target progressive thinkers. We should target right-wing Israelis and institutions of the state of Israel. Thanks very much.
Thank you, thank you very much, panelists. Right, uh, we're going to have a 20-minute uh, conversation amongst the panelists before we open it up to the floor. Um, Dennis and, uh, and William, Zaki asked you a number of questions. I don't know if you would like to kick off by responding uh, to some of them. Yes, I, I do. Um, I think that the description you make of what happens in Israel and the treatment of Palestinian child prisoners is completely accurate. My reading of, in preparation for this debate and in the period surrounding the time when I was showing my work at an exhibition in Israel, showed me that almost without exception, every impression I had of acts of brutality, of disregard of the law that I had assumed and had read were in fact worse. The situation was worse. I have no doubt that all pressure needs to be brought to bear to change the attitude not just of the Israeli government but of many people in Israel who live in a comfort zone and have an enormous separate, as white people in South Africa did, an enormous separation between their daily life and an academic or a psychological knowledge of what was happening in townships around. I have no dispute with you over this over this question at all. My question, which in a way is brought to, to the head by your two remarks, one regarding uh, Israeli dissidents, the second regarding the fact that the Israeli Supreme Court rulings are being disregarded, which both show cracks in a monolithic society. Admittedly small cracks. I'm not saying the opposition in Israel is gigantic and that it is, in many cases, very small. People who prepare to their, put their lives on the line and go and stand in solidarity with Palestinians at the different protests um, is small. But the question, that is not the same as saying that from the outside, the cultural boycott or the academic boycott is the way of addressing these questions. Precisely because in Israel, even more than in South Africa, there is such antagonism, contempt, and dislike of Jews for Arabs, of Arabs for Jews. It seems even more important that different, a varied series of different interventions and attempts need to be made, which would include, as I said, in the contradictory position, people both who call for and advocate and support a boycott, and people who work within believing that both within people working and institutions there, more than one thing is happening, and that within that multiple way of happening, there is work to be done. Thanks, William. Thank you. Dennis? Uh, I, you know, I began my contribution by trying to say that there's some things that are common cause. So quite frankly, yes, I did. The fact of the matter is, if you'd listened, you'd have seen that I actually think the, uh, the occupation and the oppression which results therefrom is an abomination. It is perfectly clear that you take any kind of human barometer, whether it's education, health, etc. I can, I've got all these studies myself in my office, and I agree with you. That's not the point. I want to reinforce something that William has said. It's about attempting to develop a politics which to a large degree can assist to end this. And let me start off by one of the things that has always shaken me about Israeli-Palestinian politics is a level of hatred there which I never found in South Africa. For a very long time I felt this, and it's disturbed me greatly. And it is absolutely correct that the education system on the, on the any occupied territories is, is nothing short of an utter and complete disgrace. And, if you wish, an international human rights breach. I accept that. But I'm also equally disturbed by some of the education that Palestinian children get from Palestinians, which is well documented of enormous hatred of Jews, perpetuation of Jewish stereotypes, the elders of Zion, protocols of the elders of Zion, and the sort of reinforcement of stereotypes both ways. The question is, how do you break that? These are people, if we're ever going to get some level of justice for all, have to engage with each other. And if there's a small contribution that we can make to break down those barriers, then we should be doing that at all costs. 
And so when Zaki says, makes a concession, I'm not attacking the dissidents, he says. Well, I'm not sure how big the dissidents are. They're probably somewhat larger than a few people. In fact, significantly larger. Israel is a hugely complicated society for all sorts of reasons. It is true that you catch me at a moment, Zaki, where I despair as much as you do about Israel. In fact, more so. Because to be perfectly blunt about it, my very identity is inextricably linked to that part of the world one way or the other. And it, it's... Ter- it yeah. So just, sorry, I'm, now I politely listen to you. You can take your question afterwards. Thank you very much. The you fact of the matter minutes? is... No, just let me finish. The fact of the matter is that, that, that the only way that I see a politics of making any sense is to exploit every gap that you can and to reinforce every initiative that there is, which at the end of the day can build the kind of communitarian vision which will give you some settlement there, however so defined. And may I say this, I don't want to get into the kind of debate that you're trying to get me into, which is what is your vision for a future Palestine-Israel? That's not for me. That's for the people there. My vision is, in a sense, informed by a global politics of justice, which despite your protestation about protesting about Syria, I'm sorry to say, we spend far too little time on Libya and, and Syria and far too much on this, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Dennis. Um, and you, you want to... Let me respond to the question of stereotypes, where Dennis is clearly right. They do exist, and they are bitter and full of hatred and so on. That hatred has been created over the last decades by the Nakba, by dispossession. It's been created, and it's very understandable. The existential crisis that Dennis describes of Jewish people is real. The persecution of, uh, of, of Jews by Christian Europe, not by Muslim uh, Asia, has endured over centuries. And this has created precisely that trap, if you like, that Zionism has uh, led people into, a notion that they can take on the role given to them. Herzl, in his um, uh, uh, Jewish state of 1896, speaks of establishing a bulwark of civilization in Asia, of uh, establishing a bulwark of Europe on, on, in, on behalf of, of, uh, of the West. Their need, if you like, to uh, redeem themselves from the Holocaust, their uh, thirst for oil, all of that creates that particular trap. Similarly, many Arab uh, leaders and Palestinian leaders have also walked into, blindly into traps of anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, and uh, various other strategic blunders that they've made. The question that you have to ask those, if you say, Dennis asks, how can you get past those stereotypes? The only way you can get past those stereotypes by people working together for a just cause. You can't get them uh, together just by, and the just cause in that case, as we're all agreed, as I understand it, is ending that occupation. And it happens. If you come across people, activists who work together, Jews and, and, uh, and Palestinians, Israelis and Palestinians, you'll find that they're perfectly easy together, that you know, there's a kind of comradeship which is maybe deeper than in a society where there aren't those um, racial divisions because they know, both know that they're putting them, their lives or their bodies on the line for, for, for each other. It's happening also right now. The 150,000 strong demonstration the protest about, uh, primarily about housing that took place in Tel Aviv on Saturday, uh, this weekend past, and I think is going to take place again now. One of the slogans, which was on many of the banners, read, Mubarak, Assad, Netanyahu. Those three names together. And putting those three names together, I think, was not just uh, capturing the deep reality of uh, the housing crisis that ordinary people in Israel, uh, ordinary Israelis face, but also capturing something of the reality of, a, uh, of the oppression of Palestinians, which legitimates also the Mubaraks and so on, which buys the, um, the American support for them, and le- legitimates similarly the Assads who can posture as, uh, as champions of, uh, of Palestinian liberation. presume to uh, uh, um, shape your response, but I I think it would be helpful if we could focus on the issue of boycotts, because we've had a lot of discussion about the conditions, and it it doesn't seem to me that there's a huge amount of uh, disagreement. We've got to get to to grips with the issue 
of a why uh, an academic and cultural boycott. We, I, I want to hear why uh, this is going to be an effective way of giving effect to uh, your political and moral position. Well, first and foremost, Dennis called boycott the po politics of despair. Now, that is not simply uh, historically incorrect. It is misleading. Because if we remember, the boycott is a venerable tactic in the United States, in South Africa when we boycotted elections, in South Africa when we boycotted white shops, in South Africa when we did create a moral opprobrium against the apartheid regime, because that's what the boycott does. No, come the on, academic Dennis, boycott, Dennis, and the cultural boycott contributes towards a moral opprobrium against the Israeli state. And it's essential that progressive academics in South Africa and progressive w cultural workers in South Africa, artists and so on, I hate that word, cultural workers. It speaks of what William called the art, art commissars. I don't believe in art commissars, but I do believe that the greatest artists are among the most progressive people in our societies. And I do believe that they ought to go to Israel. But the places they go in Israel to exhibit, the places they go to Palestine to exhibit, is different. They should not go as guests of the State of Israel. Academics should not go as guests of, of when we invite Ayal Grash or Niv Gordon or Tom Segev or even Benny Morris. When we invite them, we should have them as academics who oppose, Israeli academics who oppose the occupation. For me, it's vital to have them. But it is critical that we take a very clear stand against the Israeli state. And Dennis, here I'm going to say something to you, uh, if Paula will allow me, about the vision for Palestine and Israel. I support the right of the state of Israel to exist. And I support an independent state of Palestine with contiguous borders. However, that is going to happen. So I'm not going to duck. Because if you duck the question, you have to say to yourself whether you support the destruction of the state of Israel or not. That, that question you have to face. So for me, I support the cultural, academic, and economic boycott because it creates a moral opprobrium against the institutions of the state that commit war crimes. It creates a moral opprobrium against what is unacceptable in an international law and unacceptable for any progressive academic or, or artist, thinking artist. Would you like to continue your conversation or would you like to have the audience uh, engage with you uh, from now? Sorry? You want to make one small comment. All right, off you go. My, my one small comment is this. Following what Zaki said, once you accept, as I indeed, of course, I'm delighted that you do, the inalienable right of the State of Israel to exist, you've got to think of what that means. And I think there's a massive difference between the government of Israel Right, and the state of Israel. Because if the state of Israel is going to exist as a state, then think through what the consequences of that are, as opposed to a government. The second thing you've got to think about is, if you're going to start having an academic boycott of some and not others, how are you going to do that? Are they all going to go through the Zaki Ahmad meat grinder? Or are you going to basically say, this one can come and that one can't come? That makes it an enormously difficult issue. And I want to say that with all of the problems and all of that which you have sp said in Israel, one of the things you have not grappled with is the extraordinary complexity of a society which at this moment is dreadfully in right wing, yes, but which to some extent have got significant enough elements there to reinforce a possible progressive politics that I for one refuse to allow them to do on their own isolated in circumstances where they remain undefended from the right-wing attacks of people like Netanyahu. No, Zaki, no, Zaki you can't. Um, uh, Andrew or William, would you like to say any, would you like to say any more? All right. Okay, Zaki, you can. 
the complexity of Israel. Dennis, come on. The, the fact is this, that Israel is a complex society, so is Palestinian society. But if we look at the numbers of people who oppose the occupation with their bodies, with their bodies, then we have to count. For me, that is the test. For me, it's the test of an Israeli academic when they say, I support the Goldstone Report. That's a test. You yes. see, okay. you see exactly. But let me, let me, let me just quickly say to this to, to Dennis. I don't stand on the sidelines. I engage daily with Israelis, Jewish Israelis, and Palestinian Israelis on a daily basis. They in breaking the silence, they in, they in uh, coalition of women for peace, they in solidarity, they in Sheikh Jarrah, and they in the Populist Struggle Coordination Committee. I do it from here and I go there and I meet with them. But the question is, do we bring them here? Yes, we do. But will I bring a right winger? No. Um, yeah, uh, well, I think, I think actually on that basis, it would be useful to open the question up to the floor. But I, I would actually like us to focus on the question, which is about um, academic and, and uh, cultural links between uh, South African institutions uh, and Israeli institutions. Uh, I'm going to ask Jay and, um, and Imran to uh, organize the distribution uh, of the mics so that everyone will get an opportunity to air their views. Uh, we, we, we don't want very long speeches, please. Um, uh, Imran and uh, Jay are in control, and when they ask you to please uh, stop speaking, I would ask you to give them full cooperation. So, uh, Imran and, and Jay, over to you. Um, I assume you've both got mics. For a moment, when, when Madam Chair stood up and when William Kentridge spoke, I thought you might be able to move away from what the great, great texts and big questions was in this particular session, a kangaroo court. I really thought for a moment, by some sleight of hand, you might have been able to pull the rabbit out of the hat and actually move away from it. But it didn't take long, of course, before we got back to where it really was. Israel in the dock, by unanimous consent, by, by the way, unanimous consent of the entire lot of the panelists, Israel in the dock, are there mitigating circumstances and what should be done about it? Now, one has a certain sympathy for the uh, Arab Middle East from, uh, from uh, Tunisia to Libya, from Egypt to Syria, from the Yemen to the Bahrain, all up in arms, it's a flame, and yet here it is, Israel, the tiny little democracy in the Middle East that is the subject of the great text, big questions debate. The irony of it, I hope, is apparent to those protesters throughout the Middle East and North Africa who are fighting for basic decent conditions in their lives enjoyed by Israeli Arabs. Uh, I would like to just point out a couple of facts. One is that the Arab Israelis in, in Israel, the Arab Israelis in Israel enjoy better and more human rights than the Arabs in the vast majority of the occupied territories. Secondly, I reject totally the simplistic notions of right wing and left wing. I know lots of people that Dennis Davis would be happy to call right wingers who are also concerned about the plights of the Palestinians, who would also like to see a Palestinian state arise. I, I reject completely the travesty of a complex reality that's revealed by this. And finally, Mr. Zaki Atmat, I was at a Palestinian rally not long ago, in fact, the 3rd of June last year. And these were the words, which I remember, I would like to play them back to the audience. Unfortunately, I don't have the recording apparatus here. But these were the words. This is the beginning of the end of Israel. Let us stop talking about a two-state solution. 
Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. So let us have quite clear what the eliminationist agenda that is faced by Israel. Did you have a question? Or you... No. no. I will let, let's ask a question. Yes, so get your let's, question to now. Yes, right now. now. Right now. Thank you. Right now. Are we going Mr. Zaki Akbar, do, do you agree with the sentiments expressed by that speaker? Uh, thank you very much. We're going to take a few questions uh, and then we'll ask the panel to respond. Am I number? Okay. Just a comment. Everybody over 35 who's lived in South Africa would know firsthand what apartheid was about. All the speakers tonight bandied the word apartheid. Now, for anybody who, who knows Israel, to speak about apartheid in Israel obviously knows nothing about Israel. Thank you for the presentations today. I just want to speak as a South African academic and say that with us in the 21st century, it's quite barbaric to see bloodshed. And we need academics who are gonna humanize the situation. And that is why that Judge Dennis talks about the existential threat. Is the answer to that, we must humanize. And if academics are not doing that, they are failing the actual reason why they are there in the society. They are the edge of society, the creators of knowledge. If they do not fulfill that, they must stay at home. Yes, um, I want to support the previous speaker and I think I want to focus the conversation on the issue of um, the question of tonight, whether it's um, good or bad to um, have an academic boycott, a cultural boycott, etc. And I must say, much of tonight, when I listened to some of, and Dennis in particular, um, and William, I was reminded of this discussion during my youth and my growing up as an activist in South Africa. For me, it's not about art primarily, or art making, or uh, academics, or opening universities, etc. When we're talking about using the boycott, we're talking about a tactic and a strategy to help to bring about a particular change in society. That's what this is about. It's about bringing about conditions that will help to build social justice, as Andrew said. And I think that is the issue that we must ask those who are against the boycott. Are they able and are they ready to use means, whether it is a tactic, whether it is a boycott, whatever it is to bring about social justice, to bring an end to apartheid Israeli occupation? That's what this question should be about. And I think that unless we answer that question, then we will sound exactly as we sounded, as white South Africans sounded during apartheid. No, we can't have a boycott. No, we can't have a boycott. It is going to, it is, it's not correct. You know, what about freedom of speech, freedom of academic, da 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 da. Thanks but it's much. really about the protection of privilege. <laughs> this is what it is, the protection of privilege. Thank you very much. Okay, um, would you like to respond uh, to, uh, to, to that cluster of questions? We can take in different order. So, William, would you like to begin? I think you're right that it is a question of tactics. And what I was trying to point out in the initial remarks I made was that tactics have consequences far beyond the initial or the, the limited aims they set out to, to reach. I think that you also are right, saying that it's too simple to say uh, there are all these gaps and cracks within which um, 
intervention should still be made so one needs to not have a boycott. And I think it is a question which gives pause, whether, which gave me a lot of pause during the this, thinking about this, how much it felt like simply trying to get around what felt a comfortable <coughs> position. But I still don't think it answers the questions of the use and the contradictory nature of compromised institutions in South Africa and now in, and now in Israel. But I don't think it's a foolish question at all. I think it is the right question from my point. Okay. One of the things I want to say is that the call for the, the discussion of the boycott doesn't really match what is in the actual Palestinian civil society call for a boycott, which calls, as Zaki has said, for a boycott not against individuals, specifically exempts it, says those individuals representing the state. The question of a state and its legitimacy, well, let me, I could talk about that, but I don't want to take time with, with, with that. The, the, what is the alternative to it? The problem that I think Dennis and other sp speakers have got is if you're saying you're in favor of Palestinian freedom, but you want to achieve that freedom against the people of Palestine, it's a, a, a kind of something of a parallel to the, uh, the uh, Verluchte uh, nationalists of the 1970s in the apartheid years, who were very often scathing of their critique of apartheid, but were insistent that the change had to come by exploiting the undoubted cracks and complexities within the white, uh, white power structure and would not, in that way, align themselves with a project that brought about that change. Let me say one more thing about the boycott, and that which hasn't come up really so far, as it seems to me, well, let me start here. I think Dennis is right to say the, the role that we can play is a modest one, and we have to take that on board. A big part of what we're doing in, su in supporting or mobilizing support for the uh, boycott is not so much isolating uh, Israel, that's a long way from happening, or the state of Israel, what we're doing is trying to conscientize people, make people aware that there is an issue there, trying to hold people to the, 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 the rhetorical commitment they have to social justice. UCT has this notion of social justice all over its mission station, statements and so on. It's very easy to stand for social justice in retrospect. It's very easy to give a honorary doctorate to a, a former political prisoner, now a global icon, but the hard part is doing it when it actually has a cost. And that's the part where, where it seems to me the question of Palestine serves as an absolute test. It seems to me a kind of crossroads for all humanity. And what we can do is put what little weight we have in taking a direction, in saying the direction we want to take is that of social justice for all in Israel and Palestine, but for all anywhere regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, and so on. Um, thanks. Um, uh, I, I'm going to ask you uh, to clarify something for me, because I think Andrew's intervention is beginning to make clear what may or may not be entailed in an academic boycott, because you're saying it's not against individuals, it's against institutions. So what are we talking about here? Are we saying that UCT should not have a formal memorandum of understanding with any uh, Israeli um, uh, institution that has, for example, links with the military? Or are you saying, oh, no, I haven't finished, or are you saying that the professor of law should not go to a conference in Tel Aviv uh, because that would be seen to be, uh, I mean, I, I actually think we've got to be, make very clear what we're talking about. Um, Andrew's begun to surface some of the issues, and so it would be helpful if we could talk about what it is. That, that when you talk about a boycott, what are you actually talking about? Darren, Daniel Barenboim and, and Edward Said going and playing uh, music. Is that part of a cultural boycott? I mean, I know Edward Said's no longer with us, but I, I need to find out what you mean, please. Thank you. you. No, sorry, Dennis. Um, I don't mind either of you, but, uh, but I, 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 I I'm, not, I'm not in favor of the boycott. He is. <laughs> I think I made it clear. Sorry? For me, it is UCT should not have a memorandum of understanding with any Israeli university, and in particular those with links to the Israeli military. And there's not a single, there's not a single university in Israel which does not support the occupation through its military. And that... But Come are, on, you Dennis. Say, are you saying that professors of law can uh, uh, present papers at academic conferences? Here's the question. 
It depends on who calls the question. If it is a, if it is a conference that is called to, to justify the occupation's military law, Dennis definitely won't go. I know he won't. He might go and argue against it. Uh, I doubt that he will want to go to uh, 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 that sort of thing to get attacked very badly. But if there's a conference uh, against military law, I have no problem with people attending. Similarly, I have absolutely no problem with progressive ac Israeli academics coming here. But if a right-wing Israeli academic comes here to speak, I will protest against them coming to speak. Uh, Zaki, I'm sorry, but I do have to press you on this. Um, you, you, as a member of civic society, have a position that you will support certain things and not others. But I ask you, how does the council of a university which is pluralistic, which has many different views, say that certain people are allowed to come and air their views at UCT and some people are not? And some people can go and um, express their views and others can't. And I'm not, take, I'm not taking sides here. I'm trying really, truly, and honestly to try and understand what the, what the issues are at stake. So if you could just clarify that, then I'm going to ask Dennis. Uh... If you have an extreme right winger invited by the, one of the, uh, the maths department, or like that chap who came to do the Nobel laureate who came to do the academic freedom lecture, if he's invited, if he's invited, People have a right to protest against it. Not to disrupt, because I don't believe in disrupting people. I don't believe in disrupting people. On the other hand, your council has to take a stand. Do you support the Palestinian struggle for freedom? Do you support the right of the state of Israel to exist? And how you do that? If the person comes to represent the state of Israel, you should not allow that as a representative of the right. state of Israel. Thank you, Zaki. Uh, Dennis, and then uh, after this, we'll open it up again. Dennis. I mean, what we've just seen in the last couple of minutes with this kind of amazing amount of linguistic hermeneutics to the, my left is precisely the problem. And it is a, of course it's a problem, right? And I must say this, let me just make two points. I know that I'm right when, when I say when I get attacked by Mike Berger, who I have no difficulty in saying from the extreme right, and from Andrew Nash. Let me just deal with this. The reality is that if you are going to deny that there isn't injustice perpetrated on Palestinians, I can't talk to you. I mean, it's just absurd to argue that there is not significant, excoriatingly painful injustice on a day-by-day -day basis. That's not what we're talking about, for goodness sake. Nor do I believe that that's going to last forever. I know there are people in this room who believe quite happily that they want the occupation to continue forever. I say it's not going to happen historically, it's not going to happen morally, it's going to end. And the question that you've got to ask yourself is what is the politics which is going to assist for that ending so that Israel can take its rightful place and exercise what I truly believe is in its inalienable right to exist. And to be perfectly honest, Andrew, I take extraordinary offense by your snide remark Come that those of us, no, and I use that word advisedly because I've tried to keep personality out of this. No, your you snide must remark, to do so. no, because, because what he's suggesting is that people like myself who are seeking to argue on the one hand, that there is an Israel that can truly be just, and it can be just in the sense that there can be justice to both Palestinians and Israelis, contrary to what some people in the audience might think. And somehow, if you want that, and at the same time you believe that you can exploit the differences within these societies and reinforce progressive forces, that you somehow, like the National Party of 1970s, I take huge offense at that. When okay. you were teaching at the University of Stellenbosch, I was on the front lines at UCT. I don't need to be lectured about the fact no, that no, I'm somewhere else. No, I do Come. take exception to that. Um, uh, we, uh, are we going to take some more questions? New people, Jay, please. Um... I have a mic. Jackie. Do I talk? Yeah. You must catch their attention over there. Right, who's next? 
Where's the microphone? I've got a question here. Uh, my question is on um, adding to the question of the alternatives. With a debate like this, it's very easy to, talk, to, to ask the question, should we have a cultural boycott? And we don't talk about alternatives. And adding to the question of alternatives, um, to William, to Dennis, who are saying that they oppose uh, the boycott, when you, when you present your, alter, your alternatives, please just um, present practical ones, something that translates into everyday action. For us, a boycott is understandable. When we say, boy, when we say to somebody, you need to boycott, that's what you mean. But when you say an alternative, and you see the situation is more nuanced there, but you don't spell out practical actions that people can take, things get lost. They might even result in, in, in action, which I guess would be the worst thing. Thanks. Um, I think we take a few more, uh, Jay. Uh, yeah. I think there are people uh, over here who want. I have a mic. Uh, first of all, it's nice to be back at Eddie Hall. I wrote many exams in this hall. And I just <laughs> want to uh, preface uh, a comment by Judge Davis on, on Professor Mike Berger. He might regard him as the far right. The far right regard him as pretty moderate. But the question comes, I'd like to address this to Mr. Adrian Nash, that he talks about boycotts, sanctions, and disinvestment to end the occupation. I don't know if he's aware that the Arab League created the boycott office in 1946, two years before Israel was even founded. And they were already propagating uh, boycotts against Jews, because there was no Israel at the time. And Jews are quite used to being boycotted. Anybody who lived through the 30s or know about the Jews' 30s where academics uh, in this room wouldn't be allowed to lecture at uh, German universities, etc. But the question comes, Mr. Nash, is you mentioned that you are not, you're associated with the Palestine support committee. So we'd like to hear from you, number one, is do you personally support an Israel state? And number two, does the Palestine support committee uh, support the two-state solution? Because according to what I've seen, and Professor Berger has also said that, they're looking for a one-state solution. So isn't this boycott the first step against Israel to maybe end the occupation and thereafter to end the, the actual Jewish, and I use the word very carefully, the Jewish state of Israel. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, I think let's take two more and then yeah, we... And then then Asking for it for it. Thank you. Um, my question is posed to Dennis. Dennis, your entire argument against the boycott seems to be built on the notion of isolating Israeli dissidents. Now, I think both Andrew and Zaki made it patently clear that in terms of the way they see the boycott working, that Israeli dissidents who support the cause of the Palestinians will not be isolated. In fact, we will welcome them in our ranks as part of our campaign. Now, that deals with your argument. So I want to know, over and above that, why are you still against this boycott, this cultural boycott? The second aspect of my question is that the cultural and academic boycott is part of a package of isolating the state of Israel. Where do you stand on that? Are you against economic sanctions? against Israel? Are you against um, sports boycotts where we isolate national teams of Israel, etc., etc.? So give us clearly your position on all of that in relation to the state of Israel. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah. We'll take one more and then we'll uh, ask the panel to respond. I, I've got a, a hand flapping over here. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, just one more and then we... Uh... Okay, um, I really uh, don't think only uh, relying on academic uh, boycotting is, um, uh, is, is really, for me, only relying on uh, academic boycott is, is kind of like uh, a suicide, you know, uh, for Palestinian people. You know, I think there should be more kind of like uh, political... Uh, solutions that can be taken, you know, because, um, you know, we, we, we should, uh, or they should reconsider uh, segregation, you know, which has also played part in this. And um, so, like, uh, the division in the, in the space. So, 
the, those kind of politics has to be taken in consideration, not just because if we only rely on this um, academic uh, boycotting, it's like we bumblesing in the streets, you know, it's like bumbles. It's not going to take anybody anywhere, just like Thank here. You. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, that's it. Um, Andrew, would you like to start? Yes, there's a number of things uh, addressed to me, so let me see if I can be quick with them. Uh, the first is the uh, 1946 boycott by the Arab League of uh, Jewish businesses and so on. Uh, you know, whether that was right or wrong uh, is not something that I'm going to try and... Uh, I, I, I'm not really competent to tell you right now. I'm sure there are elements of blunders in many of strategies that have been attempted, elements of frustration and so on. I'm not going to try and... I, the comment I want to make is got nothing to do, it's got no historical connection that I know of, to the particular call made by Palestinian civil society organizations in 2004-2005, which are documented in a set of guidelines for what they understand of it. And, I mean, the boycott tactic has a long history, has used, moved in many places, quite likely has been used before that as well. It doesn't seem to me that if, you know, if it was the case that in 1946 there was a problem with the Arab League, what they did then, I'm certainly not going to endorse it just because it was the... the um, the uh, uh, Arab League or feel that that has implications for uh, how you respond to the, um, the boycott in the uh, boycott call of um, 2005. Um, the, Israel, the State of Israel and the Palestine Solidarity Forum's attitude. The Palestine Solidarity Forum has one simple statement, which is that we stand for social justice for all in Israel slash Palestine, regardless of religion, race, and ethnicity. We don't have a position on that, but it seems to me that as far as the legitimacy or the right to exist, as uh, Zaki spoke of it, in, um, of the State of Israel is concerned, there's a quite simple answer, and that is the State of Israel is no more, but also no less legitimate than any other state based on conquest, which is almost all, certainly, so, I mean, I don't see what is so especially legitimate about the colonial conquest of uh, Zulu Kingdom or whatever else in, uh, in, in, in South Africa or the, the genocide of Australian Aborigines and so on. Uh, and uh, in that sense, it doesn't seem to me to be, you know, the question of how state borders get, get drawn is a political question, not a, uh, a moral question primarily. I don't have a problem, you know, uh, with, in its own right, or, or with, with one state or another existing. The question is what, how it acts and what its role is within the larger global system. Let, let, let me come to um, uh, Dennis's response to, and, or Dennis's taking offence at the analogy that I made. Uh, the question still stands, and it's a very precise point I was making. I mean, it may be that he takes particular offence at, uh, at the notion of Afrikaners at Stellenbosch being in any way comparable to anyone else. As he pointed out, I was there in a tea room with many of those people. Many of them, as it happened, were, were quick to uh, switch from there to the, um, to the ANC when Breitenbach has this phrase, without missing a goose step, is uh, one of the, uh, the expressions that he, um, he, he, he used for it. But, I mean, many of them did have genuine anguish about this. This was terrible to them. And yet, they would, with the step they could not take, they could not imagine, was that of saying, well, if you want black people to be free in South Africa, you can't do this against the strategies that they're proposing. And they came in many cases to see that and to change the ways they were doing. If there's, you know, the parallel between that may be wrong, it's not personally intended and there's no cause for personal offense in it, between saying you want to free Palestinian people but you want to do it against them. I know I've taken up some time but I do also want to respond a little bit to the exchange before the thing went back, if you'll allow me on the question of, uh, when you were putting questions to Zaki about, can I, can I take a minute Very or two briefly, of that? Yeah. Okay. The, the first thing I want to say about it is with any policy that you pursue, whether it's in a university, any other institution, you can't foresee all of the hard cases that come up. And, I mean, that's true every day of real life. And it may be, it's very easy to say, well, what happens if this happens and that happens and that happens? What's your stand on that? And the answer is probably, in many cases, with any kind of political policy, it depends on circumstances. In particular, it might be the case with something like a boycott. The, what, if I can just switch slightly the focus of it. The question, uh, the way in which you asked it, Paula, was whether UCT should 
uh, refuse a, such a memorandum of understanding, what it should do about people attending conferences and so on. You could start at a simpler point with that. What about UCT's investments? What would the position be if UCT, which has considerable, I mean, it's not the wealthiest institution around, but it's got considerable money invested in one by university, South African university standards, what happens if university, university, UCT is not, for example, said that it would not invest in building an apartheid wall. It would not invest in the occupied West Bank. It's not, I mean, what would happen in that case? Would that not be at least a simpler and possibly a clearer case than the messier case of uh, boycotts with individuals who, and we, I think you have to concede, it, there will be cases where it depends on judgment to say who represents a state Andrew, and who I doesn't. To wrap up. Okay. Um, uh, who wants to go? Uh, who wants to go next? I mean, the questions have been asked of, of most of the panelists. So, um, Zaki, do you want to go next, and then I'll ask Dennis. It's impossible to reach agreement on this question, and the university will have to face the toughest decisions, like Andrew pointed out. But the first thing is the person who raised the question of the role of academics and the role of artists. And that is to make the face of people who are oppressed human. That is the job of academics and artists, and of people generally. And I think that I, I firmly believe that UCT should break links, if it has any, with officially with any Israeli university. But it should welcome, with open arms, any academic who wishes to come and who wishes to side with the Palestinian people. If there's a department who chooses to invite a right-wing academic, so be it. They have to face the moral opprobrium of that. But the university itself its council needs to face this decision. And in the beginning, Paula made the question of people who didn't want this debate to take place. And I want to end up by saying that those people have not succeeded. We have had a decent discussion. We may not agree with each other. And for the gentleman who napped while I spoke, who asked me what my position is on the right of the State of Israel to exist, I'm very clear about it. The right of the state of Israel to exist as a democratic, secular okay, state where there's equal rights for all its citizens and which Jewish people can regard as a Jewish homeland, but not as a Jewish state only, because then it is an apartheid state. Okay. On the other hand, I believe that there should be a state for Palestinians. And I do believe that the Palestinian leadership has been the greatest tragedy of the Palestinian people. And I also believe, and I also believe that Palestinian people are not under the occupation of Hamas, they're under the occupation of Israel. Hamas is an, un, is an unreconstructed Islamist body which will lose the support of the majority of Palestinians. So today I want to say this to you. So we you have to work now, together. Please? Thanks. Dennis? When you st I found it quite interesting, Andrew, there's a graduating acknowledgement of the state of Israel. I'll tell you why I think it's slightly different. It's different because I know no other country in the world where a, de where, where a sovereign state in the name of Iran has threatened to wipe it off the face of the earth through nuclear bombs. It is a, son, a society that faces an existential threat, and no matter of squirming about it will deny that. Secondly, it's not the worst place in the world. It's not the best for reasons I've given. And that's why I get really annoyed with people who say, Israel's in the dock again. Why don't you listen to what I've said? What I've said is, I certainly... Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't have a chance now. Dennis, go ahead. Mercifully, you don't. Right? right? You can write to the Cape Times and you can do your usual misrepresentations. But what I want to say is this. It, it shouldn't be in the dock in that sense. But on the other hand, the occupation is and must be in the dock. And the real issue, because I think it compromises Israel's integrity, 
long-term survival, and the kind of Israel that I want, and I believe that many millions of people around the world want. Increasingly, I might add, Jews around the world. The question, therefore, that arises in relation to the academic boycott is really a simple one. Institutions are complex things. They're highly contested. <laughs> they Take UCT. What are you suggesting? That we sort of all march to the theme of Max Price. It doesn't work like that. I know you'd like that. <laughs> but what I'm simply saying is, given the fact that these are hugely contested institutions, the real point about a non-academic boycott, not having an academic boycott, is ultimately to ensure that those institutions over there are strengthened in collaboration with us for a vision that will bring about social justice in the profoundest way. And that's why I think ideas matter. And might I just say, if we're going to have an academic boycott of Israel, there's enormous energy. What about China, Libya, Syria? Did anybody cause any trouble, for example, when the Libyan, the son of the Libyan leader, Gaddafi, I will finish right now, when he gave all that money to LSE? There is a massive amount of hypocrisy here about looking at not in a global context. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, William? Thank you. In the late 1980s, I was part of a group of artists that were asked to adjudicate which artists should or should not be allowed to show their work in South Africa or send their work outside as part of the cultural desk. And I discovered after a while that every decision I had argued for had been overturned. That there was always another meeting called at which, in the light of new information received, the decision we made at the last meeting should be reconsidered. And I discovered that what I didn't have the stomach for was so many meetings. And I think it was then that I discovered that I was not going to be an artist activist. I was going to be in my studio. And for the last 20 years, in a sense, that's where I have been. Not in the sense of saying, I'm not interested in the world, but inviting the world in and working at it in the studio. And part of the decision to show my work in, in all, with all the contradiction and compromises to show it in an Israeli institution in Jerusalem was the belief in the activity. In that activity, in the same way as I believed in the work of people who stuck to their belief in teaching, their belief in practicing the law, even within compromised institutions. In the hope that amongst the, I don't know, 180,000 people who saw the exhibition in Jerusalem, there would be points of contact, points of revelation, moments that made links to the work that was being done. And finally, in the belief, even in the face of what seemed to me unanswerable demands for boycott, I finally was not able to accept the idea that the strongest thing my work could be was to be silent. Thank you. Thanks. Um, right. Um, we, we're running out of time. We've, we can take two questions and then the, the panel will have a minute uh, to, uh, to sum up. So, two... two uh, my... There's one at the back over there. Yeah, I have, I have the mic here. Um, I found I found the discussion very one-sided. Not the discussion. Israel is mentioned. Israel is the problem. Um, in the the conflict, there's Palestine and then Israel. What happens in September if there will be a Palestinian state? In the future, will be a Palestinian state? Would this boycott? work as well against the Palestinian state, against their human rights violation. There is one Israeli in Palestinian hands that hasn't got no human rights, one only. There is not an issue of Israelis in the Palestinian state. They can't live, Jews can't live in the Palestinian state. They can't own property in the Palestinian state. So we're talking about two countries. The both of them, both of them, both of them have their human rights issues. And to have any effect in this process towards peace and towards the rights of the Palestinian, there has to be some sort of balance and sort of 
bring up the issue, if there is a boycott and if that is the tactic, well, then what does it work on the other side too? Thank you very much. Right, one last question. Mark Morris. I, I want, sorry, I've been trying to put my hand up because I thought it might be a useful clarification of what actually happened with regard to the academic boycott in South Africa. And the reason I know about this is that the academic boycott was changed fundamentally in the late 1980s. And it was changed by an organization called the Union of Democratic University Staff Associations, of which I was the general secretary. I wrote the documents and negotiated with the ANC. That's just to establish the credentials. The problem that we had with the academic boycott as it was constituted was that, first and foremost, it treated ideas as if they were homogenous. It therefore made it difficult, no space, for those who were opposed to apartheid to, to be able to exist and articulate. And we made this point very clearly to the ANC, and we said, what about the internal organization, internal ideas that are fermenting in South Africa? It's the right, the apartheid state that wanted to close us all down. First point, Dennis has made that point. The second point that we try to make is that politics is about organization. The academic boycott is about morality. It doesn't foster organization that is opposed to apartheid. Therefore, we said there's a problem with that. The third point we wanted to make was that institutions are problematic insofar as you try and boycott institutions because institutions are made up of individuals like myself and a whole bunch of other um, people. And we therefore suffer at the, at, the, at the end of the day. So what we did was to form an organization of anti-apartheid uh, 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 academics. And we called it the Union of Democratic University Staff Associations. They had more than 6,000 members at its height. It covered all universities. It was a non-racial organization. But then we faced the problem that Zaki has, is not grappling with. The problem is how do you make a distinction between who you're going to relate to and who you're not going to relate to? And a whole bunch of people said, ah, so-and-so, I know what he said. And our point, and certainly my point, was I am not going to be the Stasi. And I'm not going to be Zaki who's going to decide so-and-so is okay and so-and-so isn't okay because of what they wrote or what they said in private conversation. And in any case, what are you going to say to engineers and physicists whose business is not to talk about politics, you know, in their work itself? So the way we try to deal with this whole question was very simple. We basically try to encourage people who are opposed to apartheid to join an organization that was opposed to apartheid. If you were opposed to apartheid, you joined the organization, you stood by the organization. I didn't give a bloody damn what you said in your work because I wasn't prepared to be the Stasi. I wrote a letter to say, so and so is a member of a DUSA. Don't discriminate against that particular person and don't discriminate against the university that it comes from, even if it's the University of Venda, okay. which was an apartheid organization. So, Zaki, you have to confront the issue that has been posed to you about the way that you're going to deal with criteria. It can't mm. just be so-and-so is right-wing and so-and-so is left-wing because who's going to make the decision? It has to be on some organizational principle. So can we start with you and we will ba work backwards? Oh, Andrew, thanks very much. One minute, Zaki. Mike, very quickly. You created an organization of people who opposed apartheid. I don't think that any of the Bantustan University people were in there, or uh, uh, what I'm talking about, right-wing Bantustan people were in there. And I certainly don't think that very right-wing UCT academics, of whom there were many, as well as right-wing uh, UWC academics were in it. So don't miscast history. The fact of the matter is that there was an academic boycott, and the fact of the matter is that none of the overseas universities tried to have official links with South African universities. And that is the question. It's official links. It is not about what individuals say and do. And I would have any academic who opposes the occupation, I would have them come, come speak. I would invite them to come speak. I wouldn't invite a right-winger. And yes, there are engineers who really bold the wall. There are engineering departments who assist with breaking the wall. Don't tell me engineers are not political. So let's look at this question and come back to what we say, and that is that there should be no official links between universities between Israeli universities and South African universities until the occupation is ended. 
Thanks, Saki. Dennis? I think the point is simply this, that if you accept that there's going to be an Israel and there's going to be a Palestine, and quite frankly then, what one wants to work for is, as I tried to say at the beginning, justice for both. And I want to suggest to you that the difference between Israel and to many of the other countries in the Middle East is because it may be flawed, but because it has democratic institutions, the contradictions in those institutions are contradictions that anybody who believes in social justice should seek to support, to utilize those contradictions to in fact push for a more democratic and more social justice orientated positions. And frankly, it's not just a question of a few. If you look at studies in Israel, you'll find that the majority of people is actually do believe in two-state solutions. So that Don side more than ever was the case under apartheid South Africa. My own view about apartheid, using the apartheid analogy, it's an extraordinarily lazy and sloppy way to look at a much more complicated society. What we should be doing is accepting that these institutions are ones that we can use, that we can engage with, that we can debate with because of the power of ideas. Thanks. And we should understand that it should be our central motif in relation to this particular debate. Thank you, Dennis. Just a few points. The first is, I suppose I'm repeating myself, but one of the comment at the back about uh, Jews not being able to live in a Palestinian state is simply historically not true. Jews have lived for thousands of years for, in states with Muslims, owned property, be, participated fully. It's been re one of the miracles of 20th century uh, history, historical research has been the reconstruction of the uh, Cairo Geniza that demonstrates how Jews were integral to that whole civilization and there's no reason, I mean the Jewish legacy is one which is enormously valuable to humanity as a whole and fits in in all kinds of places. The second point I want to make might sound like sort of philosophical decor, it's the one that I started with. The whole way in which people say, well, what about this state, what about that state, as if world history was a kind of coloring in book which each page you turn over, you know, now we're on China, now we're on Libya, and you get out your crayons and you color in, you know, wh whether it's good or bad. It's, world history doesn't happen that way. It takes place, sometimes it's in a small area of the world that these massive changes can take place in the direction of things for good and bad, and if you don't have some account of that, then you don't, it seems to me, understand why Israel and Palestine are of the enormous significance they are for good and bad uh, for, uh, for, for the whole of humanity today. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks so much. And William, the last word. I feel that the people at the back of the hall who asked for alternatives, if not a boycott, what then? Ask a legitimate question. I feel enormous relief that I'm in my studio making drawings and not trying to have a coherent answer to practical, political alternatives. And at the same time acknowledge within that space, there is a space in which all these complicated questions revolve and turn into a drawing, a film, a poem, a book, whatever different things artists are doing. And that that is the space, even though it doesn't have a political solution, needs to be defended and spread. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the panelists again for a very good, robust uh, conversation. To all of you who came, don't, we haven't come right to the end yet, so don't leave. Thank you for your participation, um, your enthusiasm and, and engagement. Just the last thing, uh, Imran wants to just say a very quick thank you on behalf of uh, the Gordon Institute uh, to our panelists. Can you hear me? Firstly, a thank you to our audience for being unexpectedly civil. Uh, <laughs> given the, <laughs> uh, a thank you to our speakers for being also unexpectedly civil and energetic. And, and even clear sometimes, and, and always in interesting. Um, and, we, and we really hope that uh, you come to our series of lectures. Uh, Great Text continues on August 25th with a much more controversial lecture by uh, 
my colleague Sandra Young on uh, how Hamlet became modern. So we hope, <laughs> we do hope that, that you'll come to those lectures as well. And um, thank you very much.